Sup everyone, it is I, SPI, and this is a message that I spoke several days ago at a church's youth group, and I thought I'd share this message with you guys. You don't have to watch it if you don't want to, but I definitely encourage it, and for you to keep an open mind. Also, if you haven't checked out my title reveal for my book, please go check that out. The link to that will be up here. Without further ado, let's get into this. In Matthew 16, Jesus asked his disciples a question. He asked them, who do people say that I am? And the disciples responded by saying, oh, some people say that you're John the Baptist, some people say that you're Elijah, some people say that you're Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But then Jesus asked them, who do you say that I am? Who do we say that Jesus is? I hope that you guys will think about that question as I go throughout this message tonight. And the message that I'll be doing is over the book of Colossians. So if you would uh, grab a Bible from somewhere and we're going to turn to the book of Colossians chapter 1. Peter responded to Jesus boldly and confidently saying, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so a lot of times I think it can be easy for us to, it's weird saying limit because Jesus being the Savior of the world, Jesus saving us from our sins, isn't limiting. It's something that's very, very great and very, can be very powerful in our lives and just can transform our lives to reflect God. But Jesus is not only great in the sense that he is our Savior, but he is much greater than that. Uh, and if you would, please turn to Colossians 1, starting with verse 13. And I'm just going to read through all the way down to verse 20. And just to give you guys some context about this, the writer of these verses, the writer of this book is Paul, and he actually used an amanuensis to write this. An amanuensis is a guy that, like if Paul's speaking, there would also be oftentimes somebody that's with him that's writing down what, what he's speaking. And there's some evidence for this in uh, some of Paul's other letters, like Romans, he said he used an amanuensis, and in a lot of Paul's letters at the end of the letter, he has his own handwriting. So he actually wrote part of the end greeting himself. And he wrote this letter to the Colossians while in prison. This is to the Church of Colossae. And he wrote it because he feared that false teachers would be, that, they, that they're getting into the church and that they're disrupting uh, the gospel that he laid out to them. And they're basically telling them, that they have to stick to Jewish traditions, that they have to stick to these traditions. And I'm going to start the reading in verse 13 of chapter 1. He, God, has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross." So as these false teachers were trying to trick the people of Colossians and trying to tell them, hey, you guys have to be doing all these rules and everything, Paul comes in and writes his letter and he's like, no, instead you should look to Jesus to rule your life. And as I start to get into these verses, um, I'm just going to establish a little bit more context of why Paul is, is writing in this, in this way. It's because... The church of Colossae, it's, the, the letter to Colossians is one that, uh, Paul, Paul's very fond of this church, basically. And the thanksgiving in Colossians is one of gratitude, is one of appreciation that the people of Colossians are speaking in a manner worthy of the Lord, that they're bearing fruit for God, that they're increasing in the knowledge of God and being strengthened with God's power. Since they are basically looking to God, and since they are doing what he wants, he is thanking God that 
they are turning to him and that they are being good representatives of Christ in their community. And then he transitions here to talking about how God delivered them from the domain of darkness, which is hell. He transferred them from that to the kingdom of his beloved son, which is Jesus. And a lot of times in scripture, we can see the phrase kingdom of God. uh, And it's kind of different here. It's kingdom of his beloved son. So it's kind of interesting how Paul says that God transferred us from hell to the kingdom of Jesus. And he kind of equates the kingdom of Jesus with the kingdom of God. And they're not, they're not two separate things. There aren't two different kingdoms. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying that if we receive Jesus into our hearts, if we accept him, then he will save us from our sins, save us from hell, and we will get to spend eternal life with him in heaven, in his kingdom. In Jesus, we have forgiveness. We have redemption. If we believe in him, we can be saved from our sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. 1 John 4.12 talks about how no one has ever seen God, how we, we can see God working in our lives, but it's not like he physically, all of his glory, all of his greatness is in front of us and we can see him. Uh, as Exodus 33 talks about when God's talking to Moses and he's like, nobody can see me and live. It's because God is so powerful and God is so great and so glorious that it's too much for us. How our brains are just, we're not as glorious as God. We're not as great as God in the sense that we can comprehend everything that he has to show us. However, in Colossians 1.15, as I read, he is the image of the invisible God. So Jesus, that's what the pronoun he's referring to. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. And I'm going to turn over to another book of the Bible, which kind of helps to explain this a little bit better. Uh, I'm going to ask all of you to turn to Hebrews. It's going to be Hebrews 1, 3. And then after that, we're just going to turn back to Colossians. So he, referring to Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God in the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Jesus is the image of God. He expresses the character of God. That's another translation of this verse. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. So while we cannot fully comprehend God's glory, we can experience God's love for us and God's glory and God's will for us through Jesus. And if you accept Jesus in your heart and you let him work in your life, then you will start to experience more of God and what he wants you to do with your life, especially if you're studying and reading scripture. And that's uh, something that I hope that a lot of you will take away from this message is that by studying scripture and by simply just being diligent about it and maybe opening up the Bible and reading through it or even like jotting down some notes or something like that, you can start to learn more about God and intentionally seek Him. Firstborn does not mean that he, he was like the first person born. He was there in the beginning and He is the one who is there before all of creation. And in verse 16 it says, For by Him all things were created. So it's referring to the creator God, but also in verse, later on in verse 17, it's saying that he, Jesus, is before all things and in him all things hold together. If you guys remember at the beginning of John 1.1, John writes that the word was with God in the beginning and the word is Jesus. So So that doesn't only mean that God the Father was there in the beginning and Jesus was created later. No, it means that Jesus was there with God in the beginning, but he's not only with God in the beginning, but he is also at work with God in the beginning, as Colossians is supporting, as Paul's writing Colossians. Because remember, this word in Colossians isn't just something that Paul's writing down, which could be reality, which could be true, but it's God inspiring Paul to write these words about him. In heaven and on earth, visible or invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. So this is basically saying, this part of the verse is saying that everything 
is under God, that everything is beneath the feet of Jesus, that Jesus is greater than the stuff that's not only in this world, but also the stuff that, that we don't see, that we may not even know it's there, but God is still greater than it. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. So Jesus is the head of the church body, the body of believers around the globe and of all time. And by saying he's the beginning, another translation is interpreting this as he's first place in everything. And so another question I have for you guys is, do you put Jesus first place in everything? Is that something that you're trying to do? I know for me, it's, it's hard for me to put Jesus first place in everything. I can honestly say I don't have Jesus first place in everything. But as we go throughout our Christian walk, God calls us to try to put him first before ourselves and to share his love to other people. And as we're going out throughout our lives and encountering so many people, by sharing God's love to other people, we are putting God first in an area of our life. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. This is a little tricky. In, in my opinion, this is one of the harder verses of the passage to say that he's the firstborn of the dead. Like, wh what exactly does that mean? And it can be interpreted different ways, but the interpretation that I believe could be true is that Jesus, right, he, he died on a cross for our sins. He didn't have to, but he did. And he was resurrected three days later. So what does that mean for us? What life do we find from him? Well, the Bible talks a lot about how in the end there will be a resurrection of the dead. And because Jesus rose from the dead, that is proof that we will rise from the dead in the end. And so him being the firstborn means he is the one that is preeminent in it, where he's first, he might not have been the first person ever on the earth to come back from the dead, but he is the one that's going to kind of start that happening. Then in everything, he might be preeminent. So this basically means that he's first place in everything, as I said before, that as Jesus comes back, he's going to rule everything, and he already is greater than everything. He's greater than the universe itself, but we still reject him. We still mess up. We still sin, and we don't follow him. A lot of times we can forget how great he is. We can forget how glorious he is and how powerful he is. So how great really is Jesus? Well, He's not only the Savior of the world. He's not only the one who's with God the Father creating the entire world, creating the universe, but he's also somebody who loves you. He's also somebody who died for you. And in these last couple of verses, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. This kind of this seems a little bit like it contradicts itself at the end here, making peace by the blood of his cross, because somebody's dying here. He's dying, and by that he's making peace. That seems a little odd, but that's how it is, and that's how, that's how God shows his love among us with the verse before it, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. God gave up his son willingly. Jesus gave up his life willingly, and through suffering, Jesus was made perfect. That's what the book of Hebrews talks about. And so God is pleased to dwell with Jesus. The fullness of God is pleased to dwell in him. The word reconciliation ties into this, and it basically means that when Jesus died, if we accept him, he will forgive us and we will be made right with God. That the roadblock sin between us and God will be torn apart, will be set aside and we will be able to be with God in heaven, have eternal life with him. And God calls us after, if we accept him, to grow into maturity, to seek him more, and be dil diligent in 
trying to share his love with the world. So Jesus is not only the Savior, he's not only the one who was with God the Father in the beginning creating the world, he's not only greater than the universe, but he is also God. And this is a very confusing concept because we're humans and it's hard for us to comprehend the power of God. It's hard for us to comprehend how great God is. But the fact that God loves us and he wants us to be in a relationship with him, I just think that's really awesome that Jesus, who is God's son, is also God. And yet, even though he's so much greater, he still wants us to be with him, to be with him forever in a relationship with him.